Dispensationalism is a very important doctrine because they will mess up right here with James chapter 2 and verse 24. James chapter 2 verse 24. Very common passage. Basically, a lot of churches know that verse. It's basically by works. They say, you see then how by works a man is justified and not by faith only. So James 2.24, what it's showing right here is that there is faith and works. Now, Christians... Because they believe salvation by faith alone, they have a problem right here. So, what's, how do they reconcile this? This is a problem, alright? The problem is, because they think that this passage, when we believe in faith, alone without works, but then right here at James, when it says faith and works, they somehow mean the same thing. No, if you look at the words, that's not the same thing. Amen. But this is how they'll do it. So then they'll reword it, and they put it as this way. It is faith alone, see? No works. But this faith produces works. <laughs> you know what they're doing? They're just simply moving works right here to over here, you see? So that's a clever interpretation. You heard Ray Comfort, you heard Paul Washer, John MacArthur, and I guarantee you this, about 90% of the churches, sadly, they go by this method. But this is a plain contradiction. Why? Because look at Romans chapter 4 and verse 5. Romans chapter 4 and verse 5. If you look at that passage, what did Paul say? He said that if you don't work, but you just believe, that faith is automatically counted as righteousness, salvation. So it didn't just say faith. It said faith without works. See, that's what faith alone really means. It just means as it says. It means faith alone, without works. Look at Romans chapter 4 and verse 5. But to him that worketh not. See, let's say you don't work, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. You only believe. But it's faith and works, or it's faith that produce work. No, it says you believe, but you don't work at all. His faith is automatically what? Counted for righteousness. You see that? That much alone is enough. So we got a problem right here. Well, it's not a problem because if you look at Romans chapter 1 and the first 10 verses, who is it speaking to? It's speaking to the Christians. The called of Jesus. The church. Right? You know that. But is that what it said at James 2? Look at James 1.1. 1, 1. James 1.1 1, 1 told you who it was speaking to. J-E-W-S. <laughs> Jews. It's at the very first verse, but you just jumped all the way to chapter 2. See, it's Jews. Not only that, it showed you the time period. Look at chapter 5 and verse 3. Chapter 5 and verse 3. If you look at chapter 5 and verse 3, it's at a different time period. It's at the tribulation. Last days. It's talking about the last days. So this is Jews in the tribulation. You know why this definitely matches up? Because all you have to do is... when See, Scripture interprets Scripture. They all build upon each other. Why is it... See, here's a question. Then why does Revelation 7 mention about the 12 tribes of Israel, the Jews? Why does it mention that in the tribulation, huh? Unless, see... Not only that, if you look at, why did Revelation 14, verse 12, why did it say, keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus? Yep. Why did it say commandments and faith? Because, see, it matches. What else are you going to, see, that's why dividing makes perfect sense of the other scriptures. When you divide things rightly, everything will fit into place and make sense. But you try to harmonize this with this, you can't do it. That doesn't make sense. You divide it, see? It's that simple. It's this simple and you don't have a problem. If you don't believe me, look at their interpretations of James 2. All right? Some of them go three pages long just on, uh, just on this little verse. Do you think that's what God intended? <laughs> Hey guys, quick video explaining James chapter 2, a passage that is often misunderstood and misused to teach a works-based salvation. First and foremost, it is imperative that we establish the audience being addressed. Notice what it says in verse 1. My brethren, don't miss that, 
Have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. Notice how these brethren are encouraged to have not the faith of Christ with respect of persons, implying what? That they already have faith in Jesus Christ, signifying the fact that these are saved individuals. These are believers. These are the brethren. Look down at verse 12. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Verse 14. What doth it profit? Again, my brethren, these are saved individuals. These are believers. Though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? Now, contextually, this salvation is in reference to the judgment alluded to in verses 12 and 13. Notice again, so speak ye and so do as they that shall be what? Judged by the law of liberty. For he, this individual, shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. There is a direct relation between our dealing with others and God's dealing with us. I'll say that again. There is a direct relation between our dealing with others and God's dealing with us. If I, as a believer, show no mercy, despise the poor, and have respect to persons, God will judge me and chasten me as his child. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, notice this, God dealeth with you, how? As with sons, for what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? So again, the question is, can faith alone save me from the corrective chastisement of God? The answer is no. Look at verse 14 again. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Again, can faith save him? No. Verse 15. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. Again, notice this. What doth it profit? This question is put forth twice in three verses. What doth it profit? We are dealing with the profitability of our faith. Is your faith profitable to others? Is my faith profitable to others? Watch this. Our faith is profitable to others when accompanied by works and unprofitable to others when our faith is what? without works. Titus chapter 3 verse 8 says, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly. Notice this, that they which have believed in God, believers, might be careful to maintain what? Good works. Why? To be saved? No. To stay saved? No. To prove that they are saved? No. These things, notice this, are good and what? Profitable unto who? Men. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, Let your light so shine before men. Why? That they may see your what? Good works and what? Glorify your Father which is in heaven. First Peter chapter 2 verse 12 says, Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, don't miss this, they may by your what? Good works, which they shall behold or see or witness, glorify God in the day of visitation. The word of God is crystal clear that salvation is not of works. Again, we are saved, how? By grace through faith alone, plus nothing, minus nothing. However, our works as believers are beneficial and profitable to others, and therefore, we should be careful to maintain them. Why? For the profit of our fellow man. Look at verse 17 of James chapter 2. 
Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Verse 19, thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Again, dealing with what? The profitability of our faith. The Bible states that faith without works is dead. Meaning what? Faith without works is unprofitable. Look at verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Faith alone justifies us in the sight of God. Faith plus works justifies us in the sight of man. Two justifications we cannot confuse. Romans chapter 4, starting off in verse 1, the word of God says, What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? Don't miss this. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, notice this, but not before God. James chapter 2 is an admonition to the believer, the saved individual, to have a faith accompanied by works. Again, not to be saved. Salvation is not of works, lest any man should boast. Not to stay saved, not to prove you are saved, but rather to be profitable to both believers and unbelievers alike. So, friend, is your faith profitable to others? Or, is your faith dead?